Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first Power Hour of 2022. These monthly engagements help to educate us on a variety of topics within tech, our industry, and culture here at Proves. I'm really excited to welcome y'all to our inaugural Power Hour. Um, this, this, this is a very special Power Hour for us, especially during Black History Month, one of the nation's oldest organized historical celebrations um, taking place every year in February to honor the incredible achievements of Black Americans to recognize their central role in American history. So as we use this opportunity to make ourselves greater allies, available to listen and understand the Black experience and to educate ourselves, not only on the history, but on the current movements towards social justice and equality. Um, this year's theme for 2022, if you're not familiar, focuses on the importance and varied facets of Black health and wellness, a theme underscoring the rich legacy of everything from Black scholars, medical practitioners, midwives, doulas, herbalists, to more recent initiatives focused on mental health for people of color. So to celebrate this year, we are extremely privileged to have very two very special guests to join us today for our Power Hour focusing on achieving Black excellence in corporate America with our very own Chief People Officer, Prev Benagopal. Um, our first guest today um, is none other than Paula A. Price. She is a public and private company, independent board director and strategic advisor, very familiar with Proves, um, a former executive vice president and chief financial officer of retail giant Macy's Incorporated. She's a visiting executive with Harvard Business School since 2018 and she served as a full-time senior lecturer there. Um, at the moment, she sits on the board, many boards actually, and is an advisor of a few companies you might be familiar with, such as Accenture, Reddit, and Deutsche Bank, and many more. We also have the amazing Brian Collins to join us today. He's an accomplished organizational change maker at Google in the Bay Area, where he leads racial equity initiatives, partnering with other Googlers, um, focusing on the leadership team to make change. Um, Brian has over 18 years experience um, delivering results for organizations across the board, such as Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, NBC, Comcast, you name it, he's done it. <laughs> but um, before we start, please feel free to slack me your questions throughout the panel and you can ask them anonymously or directly ask me um, um, to ask yourselves, but do ping me first so we can slot you in between the panelists conversation. So without further delay, I'm excited to hear from our panelists today. Thank you, Tyler. And I should say it's actually my first power hour, so I'm um, extra glad to be involved um, today. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to take part. And I'm doubly glad because we have such esteemed panelists. So Paul and Brian, thank you both again for being part of the, the session today. I know it's going to be uh, very, very informative and, uh, and, and worthwhile. So there's a lot to cover. Let's get straight into this. And our theme, Achieving Black Excellence in Corporate America, that's, it's a huge topic just in itself. Um, so I was hoping we could maybe break that down a little bit. And um, the first question I wanted to ask the panelists was, please you know, give us some of your own background. Please share your experiences. How did you get to where you are today? Because any sort of achievement requires some sort of journey. And in that journey, um, I, I suspect there may have been some struggles and challenges you had to overcome. And we would love to understand how you coped with those. Um, so can I maybe pose that to, to you first, Paula, please? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very much looking forward to uh, to the conversation today. Um, so I, I would characterize my uh, career journey uh, as very diverse. You know, I've done a lot of different things and that has worked well for me, uh, but I don't necessarily recommend it for everyone because you know, there are a lot of ways to have a satisfying career. I have worked um, across industries, so in consumer products, retail and financial services, across functions, so general management, strategy, finance and accounting, mostly finance and accounting. Um, and I've also worked in the US and in the UK, at, mostly at global companies that took me to other countries as well. And uh, as, as um, uh, Tyler mentioned, um, I should also add that I worked in academia, having taught uh, MBA students for four years full time, just teaching what I had done in my previous uh, uh, career, previous work experience. My first job was at Arthur Anderson, and my uh, last corporate job was at CFO of Macy's. Um, and today I serve on the boards, uh, uh, as again, as Tyler mentioned, of publicly traded pre-IPO and private companies, and I also do advisory work. 
And I've found that everything that I've done has been additive and it has prepared me for the next thing. So it's been a wonderful journey that way. Um, but of course, uh, I've certainly pushed my way through uh, my share of challenges and, and struggles, as you say, uh, mostly to be fair, centered on learning new jobs and new cities and new cultures because I did change jobs a fair amount and I really needed to focus uh, on those things. But um, since we're, we're in Black History Month, um, uh, as a Black woman in corporate America, I certainly have experienced microaggressions and biases. Those things are very real. Um, but again, I push my way through those, often through candid conversations. But I also had and have a very strong network of friends and mentors and sponsors that I could turn to for advice and counsel and just about uh, any topic or any situation. And that I do recommend. So I'll pause there. That's great. Thank you. Let me just ask before we pass it on to... Um... Brian, you mentioned about having candid conversations. It's so important to do, but very difficult to do as well, isn't it? I mean, tell me, how did you pick up the courage and the, the skill set and the, uh, the know it all to be able to drive those candid conversations, Paul? Sure, sure. It, you know, it just so depends. It's all situational, right? So um, there's some, I, I mentioned microaggressions. Um, you know, there's some of those sort of things that you can get, just address right in the moment, right? And you go by the vibe and, you know, who's in the room. The goal is not necessarily to, um, to, um, to offend or to, um, to confront, but it's, it's really, in many cases, it's to educate. And then there are other times when it just seems more appropriate to have a, a side conversation, to, to pick the conversation up after it's done. Because sometimes people, um, they say things they don't know that they're offensive. Um, they're not, you know, certainly not most, most times this is the case. They don't, they're not trying to be offensive. Um, so those things I would, I would um, just address, I'd say, you know, you know, you said something in the meeting, you know, I want to talk to you about or whatever it was, I'll pull the person to the side. Uh, and, and these are people that I would usually know. So it wasn't like hard to do. It's, it, it's just, you know, but if we're going to continue to be friends as well as colleagues, you know, you should, you should know that this is not okay. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really is just, if it's, if it's, it's easier to do if it's a private conversation, you know, but sometimes you have to just do it in the moment because, um, it just seems appropriate to do in the moment. I mean, I have all kinds of stories. I won't bore you with them, but, um, you know, sometimes you have to do them in the moment. No, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, transparent. Brian, can we hear from you on your thoughts on this piece? Thank you. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. Um, I am so excited to be here with all of you and to be on this esteemed panel with Paula Price um, to be able to share my experiences and also just unpack a few things that we're doing at Google related to racial equity. Um, just to give everyone a sense of my background and my experiences and some of my challenges. Um, so when I first uh, started my undergrad career, um, I started off uh, as a computer science major. Um, so I focused in on what can I do that was going to be interesting, the things that I, I liked. So I like technology. I love math. And I also love like solving, solving puzzles. Like there were systems, puzzles that I could solve. I was always pulled and drawn to those things. So I had a professor that was in my undergrad career that told me, um, if you want to do a lot of good things for organizations or for, for society, computer science is the path. And she had that mindset that you can solve world hunger through technology. So that was really the doctrine and philosophy that um, I took on. So when I first started my career, I was a programmer. Um, I literally worked at a company called United Parcel Services, um, UPS, and I was in their second largest uh, region in the country, it's Southern California. And so the first project I was attached to was the SMART project. So it was basically all what customers uh, experience now uh, with the real-time tracking, being able to track all your parcels and be able to know exactly where in the country your package is and when it's gonna be delivered to you on time. Um, so that project propelled my career. And the interesting thing is I learned is that um, connections and you know being able to have a sponsor such as what Paula said made a huge difference for me. Um, there was a black woman, her name was Valerie Smith, and she actually led the Southern California region. And she took a bet on me and actually added me to that project. And that project propelled me in my career. So I ended up leaving um, UPS and I worked for a company called PricewaterhouseCoopers for 
a long time. I was there for eight years, um, matriculated up to a uh, senior manager there. But I worked on a, um, a myriad of industries uh, from financial services to consumer products to healthcare on challenging problems. And so I had a, a great learning ground to be able to um, really look at opportunities and problems and bring valuable solutions to those organizations. And that really gave me the opportunity to stretch beyond my programming experiences that I had when I first started um, you know, in cor corporate America and really expand that. So it really propelled me to take opportunities that I had the uh, chance to design roles, design functions across many different organizations, which led me to Google. Um, I was speaking at a conference um, about uh, performance improvement in healthcare at the time I was working for Kaiser Permanente. And a leader at Google saw me at that conference and said, hey, we have a problem over here and we think your skill set is going to be important. Um, so I ended up going over to Google and working on um, a company-wide initiative at the time to really stand up leadership programs of how you actually build something that engages talent, keep uh, you know phenomenal Googlers at the company, but then also really make systemic change. And then from that, I ended up moving into the racial equity commitments, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, throughout the conversation today. But I'm telling you, my experiences has been um, being able to have that sponsorship being able to be willing to uh, work on challenging problems, not be afraid of them, and then also really rely on my own support systems and networks to really help me navigate the organizations. Now, personally, I come from a military family. My father and his two brothers, um, they were all lieutenant colonels in the army. Um, so my family uh, really went through um, the military as a way to um, achieve middle class status within the organization. So I was one of um, out of many of my cousins that really took on corporate America. So I had to learn a lot through that process about how do you navigate corporate America and I see myself as a black man and be able to be successful and do things that I didn't have a model for um, when I was growing up or my, you know, my parents um, took a more of a civil service and military uh, roles. So it was really through key partnerships that I had um, in my career that really helped me to propel myself. I can tell you, I had six black executives that saw me and uh, intentionally poured into me and gave me access and taught me things that I would have probably never would have been able to get from um, other areas. And I, I speak to that because it is something that I've taken on as a professional, as a part of my ethic, as I lift as I climb and being able to give back and help others um, achieve the goals that they're looking for within their, their careers, or also to be able to get um, results and deliver it on those results within corporate America. So a lot to share, but that's a synopsis of me. Well, that's great. Thank you for, for saying that. And again, this is difficult, but when you look back at your, your, your varied career and that, um, that, that growth that you've had, Brian, what takeaways do you have that you would share with the audience that they would, you, know, you think would help them based on your experience? Yes. So the one thing I would say is that you always want to have a level of advocacy. So whatever role, whatever organization or team that you work in, you want to identify someone that will know who you are. They know what value and contribution that you have to bring. And you may be open to looking at people from other social identified groups to be able to help you be able to achieve that. Um, I say that's the first thing. The second thing is not be uh, afraid to take on big challenges. I think that in my career, the one thing that I've learned is that if I'm not afraid and it's not a hell yes, um, in terms of taking on an opportunity, it's a hell no. Um, I don't want to do it because I think that I want to establish something that's going to be game changing within the industry, within whatever company I'm working for. And I want to be challenged. I want to be stretched. And I think that's one lesson that has helped propel me into these opportunities that have pretty, you know, industry changing, I think, um, that's really helped me there. So those are the two main things I would um, offer to all the, the audience participants here. Fantastic. Thank you. And Paula, you had mentioned the importance about um, the diversity of experience and how that had helped you. But anything else just to add to, um, add to um, a takeaway for the audience? Sure. I think that Brian covered a lot of ground there. So uh, just a couple things to build on, on, on that. And it's a little hard to know who's in the audience. So I'll try to um, 
I'll try to cover, you know, a range here with my, my two pieces. My advice is always uh, to find your towering strength. You know, the thing that distinguishes you from the next person. And when you find it, to own it, to hone it. So that when someone is pulling together a team, someone else will say, you know, you really need Brian on that team because he's really good at this or he's really good at that. So you want to find your towering strength. But you also have to remember that there's always someone who will come along and do your thing even better than you. So you have to find another one after that and another one after that. And then the second piece of advice that may sound uh, cliche, uh, it would also be my third and fourth piece is to, to build great relationships uh, because there will come a time in your career where you cannot do your job well by yourself. You'll have to rely on others to help you complete a project, to give you advice and counsel, to introduce you to other people to get funding or for some other reason. So build a big diverse network of interesting people that will enrich your professional life as well as your personal life. So I'd add those two things to what Brian said. Well, that's great. Very relevant points. Let me ask you a personal question. Did you enjoy your time in uh, in the UK, in London, you were saying? Yeah, I really did. I <laughs> refer to those as the halcyon days. I was working for a company called Diageo at the time, which uh, is a spirits and wine company. Uh, and that in and of itself was just fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, but living in London and uh, just experiencing a new culture and seeing actually the US from a different perspective and meeting, you know, new people, it, it was just really terrific yeah I'm, I'm my my wife and kids are there at the moment so i'm a bit homesick but it was good to hear, oh. you, hear you mention it okay so okay so moving on thank you for that so just building on the um the theme today so black excellence it, i think it means different things to, to different people but clearly it's a very popular topic and uh, concept um let me ask you brian what does it mean to you personally and have you been able to achieve this this ideology of, of black excellence for yourself Sure. And so the thank you for the question, because I think that um, this terminology sometimes boxes, um, you know, Black people and also um, people of the African diaspora in many different contexts, because I do think that ex Black excellence is a is a, a, a something that you want to achieve for yourself or you hopefully you will want to achieve for yourself in your community. Um, but also, I think that it does offer um, you know, this model that we have to be perfect or we have to deliver a certain type of um, um, way of being in um, white spaces. So I definitely want to call that out as something, um, a personal ideology that I have around the, the term Black excellence. But I think what it means to me is that every single day I'm going to show up with my flaws. I'm going to show up with my insecurities. I'm going to show up with you know, um, authenticity, but also I'm going to show up with that courage and that strength um, and the competencies that I bring and the value that I bring to whatever problem I'm solving within an organization. So that's one, you know, holding both and balancing them together is something that I really think is important in this space. So I want to, you know, really bring this topic here about what's really familiar for me and what really matters. So in this area, it's about how do, can I show up with the most uh, power and strength in whatever I'm doing or how, whatever problem that I'm working to solve. And so I think that it's regardless of whatever social, uh, social status or identification that you may have demographically, um, it's going to be important in any corporate setting, um, you know, work setting. But it's still important to realize that you know you bring the best of yourself every single day to your organization and teams that you're working with. Um, but black excellence is encompassing of a lot of different things for me. Um, so I'm curious about what Paula thinks about. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Paula. That's it for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was actually curious to hear what Brian was going to say uh, to to, the, to that question, um, and uh, and it was very enlightening. You know, when, whenever I've seen uh, this expression used, I've actually taken it to be quite literal. You know, I've I've seen it with the hashtag on social media, and I've seen it used in posts that you know feature someone who is black who is doing something amazing. 
And it could be anything because excellence is in the eye of the beholder. So it could be some type of, you know, difficult gymnastics move. It could be winning a spelling bee. It could be winning an award for, for anything. Um, but I believe the intent of Black excellence is to highlight uh, and make visible the vast accomplishments of Black people and to inspire others to be excellent in their own way by presenting a wide range of examples. Um, so, so that's how I interpret it. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, that, you know, it can, it can bring about a certain amount of, of pressure, but um, to be excellent, to be perfect. Um, but I don't think that that's the, uh, the intent and I've never interpreted it to be that way. It's interesting. I was, I was speaking to a colleague who, who felt the same that you know that the concept of excellence puts pressure on ourselves. But I think Brian, to your point, if, if you're authentic at the same time, it diffuses some of that pressure. So it's, it's very important to try and keep both in the um, in the forefront of one's mind, isn't it, in terms of uh, excellent and being authentic as well. You know. But I love what Brian said about you know just uh, being being your best self, and uh, and and I think perhaps ultimately that is the idea of excellence. Absolutely. Thank you. So that actually um, takes us on to our next topic. So a, a very key theme um, um, this year is about Black health and wellness and what we as individuals and organisations should be thinking about with this in mind. Um, Brian, let, let me just pass it over to you. So I'm sure, sure there's a lot happening in your space um, in terms of addressing this. T t tell us about your experience in this regard, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um... Thank you for the question. A part of what we're doing at Google, and I'll frame it from that perspective, is that we have um, this effort that's called the racial equity commitments that I'm leading globally for the company. And there's eight of them. Um, they're strategically placed. There's four that are looking at our communities and our marketplace. And then there are another four that are focusing on our workplace. And we have health and well-being centered in both of those uh, areas of our commitment. So one is primarily focusing on economic opportunity about how do we look at our societies and our marketplace to ensure that one, we're using Google's you know, capital and also Google's influence and the access that we have to empower communities that are underprivileged and also focusing on our black community. So we've done a lot of specific efforts that have been public. Many people have seen them and has not been done by any other company. Um, to help HBCUs, Hispanically serving institutions, being able to support the Equal Justice Initiative with Brian Stevenson, um, also taking initiatives in our financial spaces to build treasury bonds, also other mutual funds that support communities on a year-over-year um, -year basis. So not only that, um, you know, looking at our products and making sure that we're supporting Black creators and we're supporting Black businesses, we've also announced a you know, $2 million commitment with Project Greenwood, which is based on the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre that happened over 100 years ago. So economic opportunity is one of the fundamental things that we're focusing on. When we think about an organization um, internally, there are people that, are making, that make up Google. We have 150,000 Googlers. And as a part of our workplace commitments, that we were very intentional about what we were doing, not only about building pathways for talent that come from underrepresented populations, or we would say underrepresented minorities, but we're also thinking about how we are building health and well being holistically for our employees. So, a couple of things that Google has been able to do based on who we are as a company and how financially profitable we are is that we've been able to look at our employees from a financial perspective, from a health perspective, mental health, physical health, all these areas to fortify that. So let me give you a couple of examples of what we've done as an organization to really support our, our, our people. So with our racial equity commitments, it was birthed out of struggle and racial injustice in our black community. So we recognized that we had to center whatever solutions we were going to develop on our black community. So we listened and we heard um, some of the things that they were asking for. And some of the things that were primarily a key focus was around wealth building. And we know student loan debt disproportionately impacts a lot of our Black Googlers and Black communities in general. So what Google did in this space is that we instituted, and which is a continual support for the next five years, a student loan repayment program. 
So as a person that may have student loan debt, um, we're committing to matching up to $3,500 for all employees. They'll immediately get that payment contributed towards reducing their student loan debt. And that's been a fantastic benefit. $3 million last year was paid out to Googlers in support of paying down their debt, which helps them to be able to do other wealth building strategies. And then we've also done things with the leverage of Google to be able to work with partners in a health space, particularly I'll highlight in our mental health area, um, to make sure that we have more Black therapists that are supported and they're getting a living wage um, and ensuring that they're available to support a lot of the mental health um, opportunities that we have for our Black Googlers and other Googlers within the organization. And then I'll highlight one other thing that I think that some companies don't think about is that even in our health benefits spaces, we've been able to provide benefits that it's new to the industry. So an example is that we have the MAVEN program. The MAVEN program is, in particular, was designed for Black women um, in the maternity space. So as we know, there's the, the Kaiser Foundation have actually produced results from a study that shows that Black women are disproportionately three times as likely to die from pregnancy. Um, than our white counterparts or other related counterparts. So in our MAVEN program, we're providing additional services to all women, but Black women in particular, um, and support through their pregnancy process to make sure that one, doulas are covered, midwives are covered, full, no cost to Googlers, and that they will be able to have that advocacy and support through that process. So we're thinking about other ways of really being able to drive um, health and well-being in that area. Another thing that you'll see that we announced you know, publicly is about we've increased a lot of our benefits around leave. So we've doubled um, from any legislation in the United States, maternity and paternity leave. So now a Googler can get full-time pay up to six to nine months uh, post uh, birth, huge. And then also we've been able to institute carers leave, which is another thing that really helps people if they have family members or loved ones that they need to take care of for an extended period with full pay, not having any impact on them as, um, as an employee and their progression and success at the company. And then some lesser expensive options that we've added is about having health and well-being recharging days because we recognize we're in a global pandemic. People are working from home. There's a lot of challenges that are unprecedented in the country, in the world, and that we have to support our Googlers to be able to have well-being on a day-to-day -day basis um, to be able to thrive or at least to be able to cope through um, the situations that we're going as a company. But all of this was designed based on needs of our Black community and underrepresented Googlers that are saying that these are things that we want, but it benefited all. And so those are things that companies, um, I implore to think about um, as they're thinking about health and well-being um, just of their employees and their communities and societies that we all serve. Well, that's wonderful, Brian. Thank you for just sharing that with us. Paula, how do you observe this, this concept of, of Black health and wellness this year? You know, it's uh, it's really interesting. So uh, I observe it in a number of different ways, uh, many similar to what Brian has described. Um, you know, one of the benefits of being on a number of boards is that you can uh, look across companies and you know see what com what companies are doing and sort of bring those ideas to other companies. You know, these are not these are not competitive ideas. These are things that all companies um, are grappling with and want to do. Um, want to do well. So, you know, in terms of celebrating Black history, I think, um, you know, everybody is uh, doing very creatively, just featuring, highlighting Black doctors and other healthcare workers in whatever um, imaginative way um, that they see fit. And this year, since we are still in the pandemic, there are so many healthcare professionals that deserve all kinds of praise. Um, but what I also like about the theme is that it's broad enough so that every organization can further engage in a manner that that makes the most sense for it. So I serve on a, a couple of healthcare boards uh, and they are generally focused on making healthcare more equitable, so health equity. Uh, and that means making medicines or health insurance more affordable uh, to those who need assistance. Um, it means providing education to those uh, who may or may not know all they need to know about a particular kind of healthcare or drug or vaccine. Um, I've seen um, non-healthcare companies engage around mental health and anxiety reduction 
uh, as Brian has uh, spoken about for Google, I've seen companies sign up with third parties for rewards programs for their employees so that they would encourage them to do a certain amount of exercise per week. Uh, so there are all kinds of meaningful ways to make this theme come alive and to be sustainable you know, beyond one month and really for everyone. So there's, um, there's a lot of energy and creativity going into this uh, theme. But you know, most of these uh, concepts people are engaging in around the year. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. And Brian, you'll recall last week, the three of us had a, um, a brief discussion about the, the meaning of equity and, and how we should bring this into play. And so tell me from, from your perspective, how do you define equity in the workplace in this regard? And what do you think companies should be doing to promote and foster this concept of, of enabling equity? Sure. Um, so I know there's a lot of discussion around um, what is equity? <laughs> and also, <laughs> what's the difference between equity and equality? Um, so I'll just share our definition at Google and what really anchors the work that we're doing um, within our company. Um, so equity for us is make sure is really focusing on making sure that people that are identified by any social identity are not impacted by our systems, our structures in a negative, adverse way. And we're looking at those systems and structures to, to root causes and removing those causes that are causing the inequities. So let me give you an example. If we think about, you know, most diversity, equity, inclusion functions, they're always thinking about representation. So the composition of an organization, how many people do you have by demographic that fully support um, a, a derivative of the, of the communities that you serve and the customers that you serve? And so that's one angle. But what we're really also thinking about is about how our processes are impacting you. How are you uh, leveled within your job? How are you progressing within your job? What's your experience with your manager and your team? And how are you actually navigating this organization? And so we don't want our processes, if that be through a performance evaluation, through a promotion process, through your compensation, to anything that relates to you as an employee to be different than any other group and to have an adverse experience of those processes. So our equity focus is about looking at our systems and also doing very detailed interventions that are driven by data that actually help to improve experiences so we get the outcome of equality. And equality is really about looking at the whole population and in making sure that everyone can walk away with an optimal experience of an organization or a society, so on and so forth. But we know through our data that we need to have specific interventions that focus on certain populations. And as we extract from just a company, we can think about just the history, since we're in Black History Month, about the country of the United States. We all know um, we had institution of slavery, and it was for centuries in this country since 1619. And also there's been uh, le legislation and systems at play that have created inequalities in our, in our society. And we've been working to right that um, for many centuries now. So it's very similar when you think about the structure of an organization, because people are within an organization, they comprise it. And so what our focus here around equity is ensuring that black people, brown people are not experiencing our organizations in an inequitable way. So some of the things that we are focusing on is looking at how are we bringing people in into this organization? Are we leveling them with the right uh, level for their experience, their background, the value that they bring to this organization it is not statistically or differences between certain identities within our demographics. We're also looking at how quickly are you progressing in this organization? Because we all know tech is highly representative of white men and also Asian men. So how are we looking at other black and brown populations to ensure that they're progressing effectively? Compensation, which plays out for what we talked about earlier about economic empowerment, wealth building, so on and so forth, and ensuring that there's no differences within gender, but there's also no differences within other demographic stratifications, such as race or sexual orientation, so on and so forth. So we are also looking at those things. So equity is a focus intervention for populations based on data 
that will show that there is a significant difference and we need to make that difference or intervention in place to make sure equality is achieved. So that's how we look at Google. At Google that's how we look at equity and, um, and how it relates to equality. That's good. Now, thank you for sharing that, Brian. It's really very comprehensive. Uh, and Paula, how do you view it? Because there was a very interesting um, discussion we had last week, and I believe it was you, you had actually raised the issue about equity and the meaning around it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. I think Brian's answer was very uh, thorough and comprehensive, as you say, but I view it as you know, equ equity being you meet people where they are. So you acknowledge that um, you know, everybody is not at the same place for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, and so you meet people where they are so that um, everyone has the same access, the same opportunities, um, and that then you support them. So there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of uh, tentacles to equity, right? So, um, you know, I talked about health equity. Um, there is uh, representation, making sure that, you know, that the, the um, population, the, the workforce reflects sort of the population. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, that's sort of the first thing people think about when they think about equity. But um, we've been kind of beating that drum for so long uh, that now we're sort of reaching out and, and trying to talk to bring in these other areas. But you know, it's good that we've been beating that drum for so long because we are making progress. And uh, I, I believe companies are just being so much more intentional, intentional about you know, representation, not only as a reaction to the George Floyd murder in 2020, but also because now there's just a ton of research that links diversity to profitability to shareholder returns. And so we're seeing companies talk about that linkage more and more um, and insisting upon a diverse slate. And so that's, that's good news. Uh, the other area that um, I see uh, reflected uh, and discussed often in boardrooms, um, and it's, it's one of my favorite areas to talk about is uh, pay equity. And I know Brian alluded to it, but starting with the data, um, and which is a very comfortable place for me to start. So uh, it's starting with the data, asking to see the data. I've yet to meet a CEO who likes to see ugly data stay the same. They always want to see it improve. Uh, and then, you know, just making sure that we, uh, we correct any pay inequities around gender, around ethnicity, around race, uh, and then building practices that keep pay equity uh, in place. So um, I'm really pleased to see that we are, you know, um, we're using this expression. I know we had this, this discussion about it, but um, I'm really pleased to see that we're using this uh, expression of equity um, because it allows us to really uh, be more broad in terms of how we think about these, these serious issues. Absolutely. Now, this concept of pay equity, it's something that's... Um, it has global prominence now, doesn't it? And there's a lot of yes. going through and driving on that. What are your feelings and thoughts around the, the legislative drive behind some of this, uh, some of this activity, Paula? Yeah, I, I, um, I have mixed feelings about about uh, uh, legislation driving it. I do think that um, uh, at least at least my experience is that companies recognize this as an issue. Um, and again, if you start with the data um, and you, it, it, even if it's driven from the boardroom, but increasingly it's driven from the leadership of the company, um, you make progress that way. Um, when you begin to legislate things, um, you, get, um, you get people on either side, you know, and, uh, it, and then you don't make as much progress as quickly. Um, you get resentment when really, if you just think about, you know, what is pay equity um, and should it exist, right? Should, uh, what, it should, what is pay equity and should inequity exist, right? It's, it's really, um, it's hard to find people who will say that you should have pay inequity. So then it becomes a question of economics, right? And so, you know, it, then it's a discussion about, well, do you fix it all at once? Do you fix it over a period of one to two years? Um, whatever, whatever the discussion is, but it's never a oh this is not a good topic or you know we shouldn't we have pay inequities. The data shows that we have pay inequity, 
we shouldn't fix it. It's not that kind of conversation. And so, you know, it, I, I think legislation often has a place in these kind of issues, but I, I, I'm not a fan of it here. Yeah, it's a balancing act, I think, isn't it? And Brian, would, would you agree or do, do you have a differing view in that regard? No, I definitely agree with Paula um, in this area because, you know, historically we've seen how legislation has had somewhat an adverse negative uh, result based on that legislation. Um, I do agree that uh, board and leadership of companies really have to drive this related effort. Um, I could speak to companies I work for in the past, but I'll talk about Google um, and center them. So we do have a commitment um, to have pay equity and it's been publicly announced like Google tends to do. We're very transparent for most of the efforts that we do with our workforce. And so we recognize that we had opportunities for improvement and we publicly made that transparent and we've made a commitment to um, ensure pay equities in place. But we also have to recognize that, you know, pay equities have been a reality uh, within the United States for a long time. And so decisions were made uh, based on someone's social identity and gender um, to really drive compensation decisions. And so when you start looking at this data and asking, as Paula highlighted before, you know, what is your thoughts about inequities? Should they actually exist? And the response I've seen at um, you know, multiple companies I've worked for, even Google, is that they don't want to have that. They do want to correct it. They do want to make um, everything an even play field. Because listen, we are in a talent market and the market is very hot. And so when people recognize that they're not being paid appropriately, especially when they do benchmarks within the industry or interviewing with other companies, you will lose that talent. And companies recognize, and I know Google does, is that we're here to retain talent. We want them to stay and thrive. And pay equity is one of the top issues across all stratifications, across gender, sexual orientation, uh, race, so on and so forth. And we know if we want to win the battle of having the most phenomenal talent, we have to pay people equitably. That's the only way. And it's the, the way- other, The other ahead. thing I would add is that, you know, we're with this whole ESG movement, you know, we are seeing investors weigh in on like, what are you doing around all of these issues? What are you doing around representation? What are you doing around pay equity? All of these things, um, you know, a light is being shined on them already and the discussions in the boardroom used to be like I remember um, being on one board uh, where we had um, uh, it was my first board we had a woman lead director and she she had um, just a really even disposition but on this topic she literally was pounding the table uh, asking for the data uh, which I thought was awesome. So, uh, but but now, and so, you know, I, I ask for the data, right? So that's how you learn. You look around the room and you you find somebody and you observe. Um, um, so now I routinely ask for the data, but I don't have to pound the table. It's not even, you know, it's not a hard conversation. It's really a question of how are we going, how are we going to fix this in what time frame? Absolutely. Right. It's not even how, it's in what time frame are we going to fix this? When, when will we fix this? Exactly. No, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Just before we move on, Tyler, any questions or anything from your side that may have come in? Um, we do have one question. Um, before we go on to the next question, we do have one. It is, how can one be an ally to their Black colleagues at work, especially if you're white? Um, well, you know, it, it starts with, uh, first of all, educating yourself uh, on kind of what the issues might be, like what the concerns of your Black colleagues might be. Um, because, you know, Professor Google has like a wealth of knowledge um, on, uh, on these sort of concerns. Um, so, and, and I like to say that because very often, um, in addition to having to live through through um, sort of these kinds of issues, we spend an inordinate amount of time educating um, on on certain topics, and it can be um, it can be uh, exhausting. <laughs> so uh, educate yourselves, um, and then advocate. Uh, 
uh, use your voice in spaces and rooms where uh, Black people are not um, to advocate for us, to speak up on our behalf, to speak our names in conversations uh, where you know, you're thinking about who to promote or who to develop. Um, uh, it's really advocating for us. If you hear something that doesn't sound right, um, don't laugh. You know, uh, in fact, uh, uh, interject or correct or pull someone aside. Um, uh, those are some examples. That's great. Right. Brian, can we hear from you on this as well, please? So we have this saying at Google, it's plus one. And what that means is that it's a complete support of the statements that were just said previously. And so I say plus one to Paula. <laughs> well, everything she just said, um, I have nothing else to add. Okay, th thank you. Uh, and Tyler, I believe we have one more question just, just came in as well, is that right? Yes, we have another question from Tessa from Denver. Um, her question is, how does implicit bias interact with the idea of merit and com competition-based compensation to create pay equity? How do we correct this? Um, so I'm going to interpret that question. So how does implicit bias intersect with pay and equity? Interact, a, sorry, interact. Oh, interact yeah oh my goodness it's, uh sorry guys i have to get back decline my goodness <laughs> a person's calling me <laughs> um so you know i think uh, it, it it gets uh back to something uh tyler uh, um not tyler uh, brian said uh earlier is that you know we come to these places with history and um and so people uh, may make may make assumptions about you and uh, may you, you may have um, you may receive a job offer based on you know certain assumptions certain biases that people have about you like this is enough money for you I'm just giving an example so this is enough money for you you'll be happy with this amount of money it has nothing to do with how much that job should pay right and so you may offer make a job offer to this person based upon you know, what they think, what you think they will be happy with. And maybe they will be happy until they learn that this job actually should pay this. And so what you find when you look at the data um, are some real head scratchers, right? So you have two people who are highly regarded doing the same job um, that are being compensated very differently. And the only thing you can attribute that to is, you know, this person started, it's hard once a person's in a company you know, it's hard to within the uh, usual compensation system to get them to parity uh, if they started at such a different place. So I think the intersection happens um, when you enter the company and you get that first job offer, right? So um, I always encourage people to do your due diligence, you know, on, on everything, on compensation and don't, don't make, you know, don't give the first number, right? The, the number should be based on what the market pays for, for these particular jobs. So there is very much um, an intersection. And I, I, think it, I think it happens uh, most often initially, and it probably happens throughout, but certainly, um, you know, it happens initially, and then you see the data, and it's like mind boggling. Ryan, do we do we have another plus one for this? <laughs> <laughs> of course, Paula uh, covered yeah. it. Thoroughly, um, but I actually have to reiterate the point that Paula said is that I think that the one thing that we've learned through this process, and I do a lot of these uh, types of events where we speak about equity, especially uh, in the intersection of gender and race. And so the one thing that I found is that when you do your proper due diligence and looking at the market, there is no way you're going to end up uh, being paid inequitably because those and those biases are going to creep into processes across companies. It's been proven. It's been published in multiple different places. Um, I can give you at least ten off the top of my head where there's been research has been published in this space. Um, but I would have to say that doing your proper due diligence will help you to write correct any type of compensation issues that you may have, and also being able to be courageous enough to take that to your organization and say, well, these are things that I'm finding on the market. Now, how can we work to correct this in a timely manner? And so we've had, um, you know, 
some public things at Google where that's actually been the case, um, where we've had a coalition of Googlers that have actually brought this brought this to leadership's attention and they actually work to correct it. So I do know that it's possible. So I would highly recommend you do your due diligence around a role in what the market pays to ensure that you're paid effectively and appropriately. Great, thank you, Brian. Tyler, any more questions? We have two questions. One is anonymous. One is by Ashley. Ashley, do you want to ask your question and unmute? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any advice for, you know, individuals that you encounter or even companies or institutions you're involved with where they sort of like talk the equity talk and like maybe even believe that they practice, but then aren't necessarily walking the walk and like how you hold people accountable for that. So it depends on the seat that you're in. So where the seat that I am in, I always start, as I said before, with the data. That's for me a very comfortable place to start and data doesn't lie. It is what it is, it's good, it's bad, it's indifferent. Um, but I always start with the data. So, um, so to the extent that you can do that, you can arm yourself with data, um, it makes the conversations better. I mean, if someone's not open to the conversation, they're not open to the conversation, right? So that's that's one thing. But if if they are, and um, and they just need to understand the extent of it, and if you can, um, if you can start with the data. Thank you, Paul. And Brian? Sure. Um, I would say, yes, I have experienced companies that have the rhetoric, but not to necessarily follow through or appropriate competencies to deliver on DEI related efforts or um, things that we talked about in terms of pay equity, so on and so forth. Um, I would implore that as an employee of an organization, hold your leadership accountable. You know, you bought into the mission, you're working there as, uh, as an employee to provide value to whatever uh, client, stakeholder, customer that you have, shareholder. Um, but also making sure that your leadership is accountable for words or programmatic things that they're uh, committing to. So I always tell people within our Googler community, which is very active, um, use your employee resource groups to be able to mobilize um, and also make sure that you have proper engagement um, with leadership. So if you hear your leadership committing to these endeavors of DEI, or if it's focused on pay equity or any other topic of interest, ensure that you come together as, as employees of the organization and hold that company leadership accountable to the, the highest ideals that they're communicating. And so I think that we've seen in our company that a collective of employees of, and Googlers, we call them, um, has really made significant changes at this company. And so we know that the employee has power, more power than what you think. And holding leaders accountable, that's their job. They're here to shepherd and direct the mission of that company and ensure that the employees and the purpose of why they're in service um, is achieved. So really employ all of you to hold your leaders accountable. I, I love the mention of the ERGs. I mean, the employee resource groups, groups they have become just so incredibly powerful uh, over the years. I remember when, you know, they were first getting started, but now they are just hugely, hugely powerful organizations. Absolutely. And I would agree with both of you on, on both of those items. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Let me just ask one last question um, for both of you. So what is the future of Black History Month and what does success look like? in terms of Black History Month going forward. Let me ask um, Paula, let me ask you first, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it would be wonderful if, uh, if the full spectrum of Black history, which includes everything from the atrocities of slavery in the United States to the Obama presidency and everything in between and since. It would be wonderful if that were taught uh, as part of the standard school curricula, um, but that is not yet the case. So um, I would anticipate that Black History Month will be around for quite some time and that, you know, we will always look for, for new things and innovative and creative ways to officially celebrate Black history as part of American history, whether 
through uh, community service, educating about our history, celebrating achievements, building racial equity, or some other way. So I think that's the future. Great, Liza, thank you. And, and Brian? I totally agree with Paula. Um, and, and I really am interested in Afrofuturism and how we see our African diaspora in the, this country and across the world in the future. And so what really motivates me is really that dialogue about what is a, what is a society that really does uh, have the absence of white supremacy and the absence of colonialism, the absence of imperialism that um, creates systems of oppression. And what does that actually mean if we can feel that in our bodies, see it in our society, see it in our companies and our workplaces. And so when I think about Black History Month, I agree with Paula, I believe it is a part of American history. And so I want to extend this more progressive thinking about what does the future look like when we don't have these systems of oppression in place and how do we thrive all as a human race and society as a whole and imagine what that would do for our companies, for our society, for the world in general, if that was the case. So that's the envisionment, embodiment in the feeling and sensation that I would want to have um, when you talk about the future of Black History Month. That's fantastic. Plus Thank one. you. <laughs> that was uh, very powerful. Sorry, Paula, anything else to add? So I said plus one. Plus, plus one, of course. <laughs> plus one. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. I can't believe that the hour has gone by so quickly. That was so, um, so insightful and enjoyable to speak with you. So thank you with all our sincerity. It was great to have you both on the panel today. Um, and we look forward thank to you. our continued dialogues with yourselves and um, you engaging um, with the Prue family. So thank you again. And I wanted just to, to end on a, on a quote from um, Booker T. Washington. I'm sure some of you have, have heard this or read this before, but I, I think it speaks to what we were discussing today about the journey. You know, so, And he, he said, success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life, as by the obstacles which have had to be overcome while trying to succeed. And I think that speaks to your experiences and what you've shared with us and what you've achieved. So really, thank you both very, very much. This was a tremendous power. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a thank pleasure. You, everyone. Thank you, everyone.